Richard Quest, good to have you here in South Africa. What are you doing in Cape Town at the moment? Here for two particular projects. One is a Quest World of Wonder, which is essentially looking at the DNA of a place. What what makes it tick? What is this all about? And then secondly, we're doing Quest Means Business, which we're doing live from Cape Town. And that'll be a lot more about what's happening in this country at the moment. Uh, and, and, and of course, the other thing I'm here for is to talk to people like you. <laughs> Have you met interesting people in this, uh, in this trip? Very much so. Very, very much so. From the winemakers in Stellenbosch to the, the people who run the sidecars with the dogs, which was fascinating to do, uh, to uh, the, 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 the range of people has been interesting the way in which we have been looking forward to doing it, the the stories we're aiming to tell, for, particularly for Quest Means Business, uh, sorry, for, for World of Wonder, which really is what is the essence of Cape Town as a destination, what makes it tick, all those sort of things is what we've been looking at. Great story and a, a great job. Who's Brody? Brody. Brody? is the dog. Now, yes, this is the dog of the owner of the street, uh, the sidecar company. And Brody loves to be in the back seat of the sidecar. It's a two-seater sidecar. And Brody sits in the back. And when Brody's feeling uh, tired, he puts his head on your, on your shoulder. And he wears goggles. And it is, I have to say, I, you know, I've done a lot of touristy things. And yeah, this might be a bit touristy, but it was worth it. If I was living in Cape Town and I had visitors to Cape Town, I would say, let's get one of these things. The drivers are great. The people are friendly. The dog is just delightful. And you get to see the city in a way you wouldn't normally. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow, I am going kelp diving. Uh, I know, I know. That seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Richard, on a on a more serious uh, vein, I I spoke this morning to John Steenhuizen, the leader of the opposition, Democratic Alliance. He said he'd met with you, and uh, he said your impressions, unfortunately, are not as upbeat as we might have hoped. Now you're incredibly influential, you know that. Uh, when you leave this country, is there anything that that you'll be telling the rest of the world that maybe South Africa's not a completely hopeless case? I think. Of course, it's not a hopeless case. Absolutely not. A country of this size, with this number of talented people, with uh, sheer drive and dynamism, um, of course, absolutely no question that it's, there's, there's no hopelessness about it. I think the issue is the level and depth of the mess at the moment. Um, I'm always very careful, Ali, when one goes and visits somebody's house, you don't criticise the wallpaper. You don't go for dinner and then, you know, make, make horrible comments about the China. Um, and so I recognise fully that I'm a visitor here. And I'm a visitor and therefore one has to have a certain, the, 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 the circumspect locution, if you will, of the visitor. But, but, People have asked me here for a reason. And people are, you've asked my opinion for a reason. And I think that the issues that are currently being faced, that the president will talk about tonight in the State of the Nation, will be exceptionally important. Because the... I'm, I'm dancing around here. You can hear me, darling. I'm standing. <laughs> I'm dancing. Because what I'm really dancing around... How many other G7 or G, well, G20 countries, advanced economies like South Africa is, with mature functioning markets, how many of them have regular rolling power cuts and will have them for the foreseeable future?
Zero. And so I think it is very tempting to dress it up in some cutesy phrase of load shedding. Load shedding is a power cut. And this is 2023. And the reason you and I started late was because your load shedding started, as did mine. And the power went out and then something dropped and blah, 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 blah. So I think that South Africans are incredibly ingenious at working around it. But the actual raw fact that every day people are going on a very efficient apps to find out just how many hours a day they are going to not have electricity is breathtaking. Yeah, it's hard for somebody who lives in a world where electricity is part of life, as it has been since the second industrial revolution. Uh, but in our country, you're dead right. Load shedding apps are the most watched, probably of any apps, even more than CNN. That's so too kind. But the, the funny part about it is, being a first world economy in so many ways, and a technologically advanced, you have these brilliant apps and people extol the virtue of these various apps which tell you with micro precision when the lights are going to go off. And people will proudly tell you, well, the app said I, we would be in Area 7 at Stage 4. And tomorrow we'll be at Stage... And everybody's going around saying this, conveniently forgetting, what are you really talking about? You're talking about something that would be unthinkable in the US, Germany, Italy, the Australia, the UK. Absolutely, not Singapore. It would be unthinkable that for weeks at a time, 100 days, I believe, so far, and you're not losing power for 10 minutes or sometimes it's two or three times a day for several hours, up to eight hours a day. Now, I don't, you know, this is what I find, I wouldn't say interesting, but this is what I find extraordinary about the whole load shedding. Power cut. Let's get rather cutesy phrase load shedding. It's not. It's a power cut. Let me throw something at you. Some of the observers here taking a, 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 a different position, taking an observer's position, are saying that the reason we have load shedding, we know, is because the ANC government wanted to control electricity. We know that. They're producing 26,000 megawatts as against 44,000 20 years ago. We know that as well. But now that the private sector is being brought into the provision of electricity for the first time, it will unleash human ingenuity, which in fact could leapfrog South Africa into the future. Well. It, does it make any sense? Yes, of course it does. Of course it does. It makes as much sense as it does when we talk about the mobile revolution, which leapfrogged those African countries which were so slow and expensive to put copper line landlines in. And all that happened was it leapfrogged it. But here is the caveat to you, Alec. By all means, do a power supply leapfrog but learn the lessons elsewhere. Because the UK did it and effectively split power generation and distribution from power providers. It worked up to a point. But National Grid got into trouble. Various other companies, suppliers have got into trouble. And you, of course, have the famous Texas example where everybody rushed to deregulate and go to these other providers and then Ukraine happened, and suddenly bills in the thousands were arriving. Now, that is not to say throw the baby out with the bathwater. The private sector and the transmission of power through private lines is a very well understood, documented, efficient way of providing it. And let me give you one thought, Alec, as you ponder that. Could it be bloody well worse? 
Well, I guess we could have 24 hours of blackouts. We could have a, a grid that is collapsed. The reality is that if I was looking at this now, I would be scouting the world to see what is the best practice. The UK did this and it failed on that. The US has done this and it doesn't work. France has done this, but it's mainly power. It's mainly, you know, state provided. Germany's done. What's the best way to privatize or to introduce a private element? And there are numerous, numerous ways of doing it. I like that because sometimes being stuck on the southern tip of Africa has the, the, the tyranny of geography can be quite difficult for people to see outside. You, you are the, uh, the epitome of, of the boat people, of the person who goes around the world and sees what is happening in, in many other nations. But Richard, you've got a, a, a big global audience. When next South Africa comes up in conversation, outside of power, what is your, uh, what is your sentiment going to be about this? Country. My sentiment is going to be the one that there is always when I talk about South Africa, and that is the phenomenal opportunities that exist here in a workforce that is educated, that is resilient, that is committed, with an entrepreneurial spirit. I, I was reading a guy yesterday um, in a district who makes his own African, not African flavored, African infused ice creams. He's a bioscientist. Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful ice creams. Now planning to expand somewhere else within Cape Town. The opportunities are tremendous. Tourism, for example. You have a tremendous tourism offering from Leo the Lion, right the way to the beaches, to the tribal, to everything, to the cultural, the lot. How you do it, the airlift you require, the, the product, what you're selling, how you're selling it, the price point at which you're doing it. These are fundamental issues that you are absolutely eminently qualified to do. South Africa does not need to be told how to run its uh, individual segments of the economy. The last question is 2024, we have a national election. I don't know if you've had much conversation about that, but it was inconceivable even months ago that the ANC would no longer have a majority in this country. Now it is almost guaranteed that they won't be over 50%. They could be under 40%, which would usher in a very different uh, approach towards governing in South Africa. Have you, have you had any conversations about this? I do admire your very genial and um, delicate way in which you wish to throw me over the cliff into the bruha and braai of uh, South African politics. It is indeed a laudable effort, one that, fortunately, is as naked in its obviousness as Dane my career. However, I will say, these are issues, obviously, that will be left in the, quite in the capable hands of the South African electorate. But if you are right, then fundamental change is about to take place. And the electorate here, barely, what, 97, 07, 17, 25 years or so, the electorate here is going to have to behave with a maturity well advanced of the age of the democracy. And you're going to find the issue, of, you're talking about coalition, and whether it is a strong coalition of the two leading parties, or a weaker coalition of a cobbled together group, or you know the last Israeli coalition, which was so far left at one end and so far right at the other, it's almost went round full circle and met in the middle. Now we can't know, and it would be presumptuous for you and I to even pretend to 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 to, to tell anybody how to vote, but that's going to be the issue. If you are right, then the electorate in South Africa is about to enter a new stage of political and democratic maturity.
fascinating world that we're going into. Our political analysts call it edge of the seat stuff. And for South Africa, it certainly is. Richard Quest, a British journalist, a lovely to see you again and I look forward to next time. And thanks for visiting us and for, for giving us your insights. Richard, of course, is known from CNN and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. Mm-hmm.